Welcome to the DJE Podcast, where you will learn about real estate investing from real life examples. Here's your host, Devin Elder. Hello and welcome to the podcast. Thanks for joining us today. My guest is Logan Fulmer. He's a real estate investor based here in San Antonio, Texas, where DJE is. Known, I've known Logan for a long time, and um, it was great to have him in the studio here for the podcast. He's got an interesting business model. Started out buying land a number of years ago on the east side of San Antonio for for really incredible prices, five and $10,000. Along the way, uh, got into solving really difficult title issues, right? Whether it's judgments, liens, uh, delinquent taxes, that kind of thing. And has doubled down on that over the years to, to really be focused on deeply distressed assets, distressed in terms of debts or multiple heirs or really tricky title situations. And so that's what he's built a, a team around today and executes on and sort of uh, asset class agnostic, right? Whether it's land or he was talking about a multifamily deal out on the way to Houston, uh, a lot of industrial that they're they're uh, buying and keeping now. So very interesting conversation, very interesting to see how Logan built the business, how they're finding deeply discounted deals through seeking out these various distress metrics that they look for. So good long conversation in the studio here. Logan's a sharp guy. I enjoyed my time with him and I hope you enjoy the podcast. This episode is brought to you by DJE Texas Management Group, a San Antonio, Texas based real estate investment and management company with a track record of completing hundreds of millions of dollars of real estate transactions since 2012. If you're an accredited investor and would like to learn about investing alongside us in Texas real estate, Register for our webinar at djetexas.com slash income fund. Mapping out. We're, I think I might've told you we're doing 10 sites and uh -huh. then Namas. So I was almost like, Hey dude, what are we going to do? And we're done with these. Like what's you're used keep, to building. So like that's we gotta, natural. We keep building stuff. Right. So I just, I don't want to, I don't want to get too far out of our skis. I want to build this portfolio, stabilize it, see where it goes. You know, you know when you look at like the storage, facility places they understand their demand study so well they understand yep. the product yeah and not many people do there are a ton of small timers that will build a storage over here a little right i see them all the time but god man when you have that institutional knowledge like that it's yeah. tough to say stop because you've aggregated what most people can't put together put right out. yeah and you're gonna learn a ton by leasing those first three hundred percent picking sites and building like dude yeah we might keep going i just i know how i am it's like i don't want to have 25 projects in the pipeline that, that we're like going through construction. I want to get 10 done and, you know, cash flow those and just see where we're at. I, I like multifamily. They're hard to buy right now, yeah. but I think in the next year, 18 months, I think there'd be some opportunity. We're seeing stuff right now, bank balance takeovers, not, not, not the super deep stuff that you're doing, but. But operators like either. you don't need those big margins because you know what you're doing. Right. I right. need those big margins because I like would screw it all up if I had to run it like you. Like, yeah, yeah, right, right. Yeah. And we can, you know, we get fees, we get management fees, uh, asset management fees, property management fees. So like it starts to, it starts to add up with some scale. So right. We'll see, man. We just got to get through really this year. Who the, who knows what's. It's I don't know. We're back half, man. I watched a thing where they had, uh, oh gosh, the guy from California that lived in La Jolla. Come on. The old hedge fund guy when he was debating uh, Mitt Romney. Okay, yeah. His debate against Obama. Yeah. And I watched these two like statesmen compliment each other and hug. Oh, and, like, so polite and professional. And then you look at these two guys, like, what is going on? Did you see the overdub where it's the two guy? It's like two young guys overdubbing the golf conversation. No. And I mean, the fact that these guys, you're not a six handicap, and I'll play if you carry your bag. I'm like, what are we yeah. doing? Is this where we're at? What are we doing? But we'll see, man. It'd be, it'd be a fun. Uh, Devin for president. Come on. Absolutely. <laughs> under no circumstances, man. I got a full plate. Um, cool. Well, let's jump in. All right. Logan, welcome to the show. Great to see you here in the studio. Uh, followed you for a long time, known you for a long time. We spoke on a panel a couple of weeks ago. That was fun. Yeah. And, uh, here we are in the studio. So thank you, man. Appreciate it. No doubt. Anytime. I appreciate it. Yeah. Let's, let's fun. talk shop. We'll talk about metal buildings for the audience out here. Uh, how about just some background on you? You know, what, what was your background? Love to learn your on ramp into this real estate game. Okay. Um, uh, Mostly distressed real estate guy now. You know, got a little bit more commercial, a little bit more of a portfolio and some land development today. 
But in the early days, I was out working the oil field trying to figure out, you know, where am I going to go with this? And one of the early day or one of the early themes in life that kind of was tough for me is I was looking for the on ramp, I guess you could say. Yeah. My dad was a CPA. Yep. So I would always ask his clients, doctors, lawyers, business owners, how'd you get here? And I'm looking for this path. So I right. can say, okay, I'm going to do what he did. But none of them were the same. And it was so incredibly frustrating. Yeah. So you get out of college and go work for a real estate broker, um, a construction company. And then I wind up in the oil field. And that's the most money I'd ever made in my life. So yeah. that was a big deal to me. Sure. But that still wasn't like what I thought was going to happen. You know, I thought there's something more than this. So I started buying land over on the east side of San Antonio back well, a little more than 10 years ago. And yeah. it was cheap. Yep. Just and raw dirt or buying houses? Just dirt. At the time, yep. you'll find this theme. I'm really bad with management. I can go find yeah. the deal. I can figure stuff out. But the management's tough. So I'm like, great. I got to deal with tenants. I got to I don't oh, yeah. do all this. Especially over there. Those are tough tenants too. <laughs> I built a portfolio of rentals over there, by the way. Oh man. You get bonus points for that. Uh, I learned a lot. Sure. But on the land, what it was neat is the downside risk I believed was low. Yep. Because I was concerned about that early on in life. I inherited some, inherited some money from my grandparents. Yep. And I was a poor steward of that money because I was young and problematic. Yeah. And not obviously conveys for the money. Yep. I had no more of that money left at this point. Right. But I did have some oil field savings and I thought, this lot, these lots are worth five to ten thousand dollars a piece. And I thought it's a single family lot near downtown of a big MSA. Yep. What are the odds of it being worth less in the future than it is today? Probably yeah, low. Five, ten grand. I mean, right. Yeah. I thought someone will buy this for me for five grand. Yep. So I thought my downside risk exposure is very low, but the upside potential could be big. I'd seen the east side of Austin, parts of Houston and Dallas, and thought this could do good. Yeah. So if you knew that you were going to the casino and your downside risk was almost nothing, but your upside could be huge. You place bets. Feeling pretty good, yeah. I don't go to casinos because it doesn't work like that. Yeah, right. So I spent a couple hundred grand buying lots there. And the value, this wasn't planned. This was a very lucky entry point. But right about that time is when we started getting a real lift in the San Antonio valuation. Right. So what period? So this is like Dignity and all yeah. that kind of stuff or even further east? No. Dignity, Denver Heights. Yep. And then a little bit in that Highland area down there. Yeah. It was amazing. I grew up in Highland Park. My father still lives there. And then I got into real estate in 2012. My first house is actually down there. And to watch after 2012, what happened to those areas, I, I was just like, man, I, I grew up here. There's no way somebody just bought this flip house for that. Like it took me a few years to even wrap my head around, but yeah. you've seen it in Austin, whatever, but it was yeah. just kind of surreal for me. Like having grown up there and like people want to, they want to be here. <laughs> what's wrong with them? And what's wild is for a hundred years before then, a house had never been worth more than 30 grand, maybe 50. Yep. Yep, and this yep. period happens where those houses go from 30 or 50 grand up to hundreds of thousands. Right. That's like, yeah, right. It's almost unbelievable. Yeah. It's crazy. It's crazy. Um, so that's good. So that was fortuitous. That got you, you kind of go, were you using your own cash solo operator? Did yeah. you start to bring on staff or what? You're just out there hustling. No, I was looking at the appraisal district, yep. looking at the mailing address. And usually on this side of town, the mailing address to the property was somewhere in the neighborhood. So I'd there go knock go. on the door. Every couple of weeks, I'd come home from the oil field and go knock into contracts and buy. Yeah. So that was what I did. There wasn't data. There's was none of the big fancy YouTube like guidance. Back yeah. Then. Just out there knocking on so doors. At that point, I put a couple dozen of those together, but at anywhere from 2000 to 10,000 a piece, the lowest of 2000, the median price I was paying about five grand because that's what it said on the appraisal district value. And you go, Hey, I'll give you what your property's worth. Yeah. They're sick of mowing it. They owe a little bit of taxes. Yep. So at that point, I, I'd pretty much spent everything I'd saved in the last couple of years, a couple hundred thousand. So yep. I left a couple bucks in my bank account, but at that time I'm making 10, 15 grand a month and my expenses were very low. Yeah. So I didn't feel, I wasn't running a business. So I wasn't concerned about cash flow at that point. Sure. Sure. Just so, out there doing it. Any crazy stories, mm -hmm. uh, knocking on doors over there? I mean, you know, I mean, I was like one of the few white dudes buying sure. land over there. Yeah. So I got chased a few times, you know, people, <laughs> They had choice words, but one in 10 times they were friendly and they'd say, sure, you want this, you can have it. Yeah. Solving a problem. Yeah. Yeah. I love it, man. I, and I just love the, the buy, you know, your six grand. You're like, okay. Yeah. Let's do it. The crazy part is I was willing to risk that money and I'd blown everything in the past, but yeah. I thought the land is tangible. It's here. It's not going anywhere. Yep. I can get my money back out of it. And that was the biggest part. Like I got a shot at the upside, but it's not going down. It's not. Yeah. It's I not going that. to zero. Yeah. So your buyers are developers. They were, you know, or no, you there just weren't saw, any buyers just, at that time. You, okay. You're There's just amassing no, these. Yeah. These at that time there were no transactions on market. And here's where yeah. it, what the game changer was 
is the we started to get pricing pressure on the barrel of oil around 2014, 15. 15 is when it was happening a lot. So my projects were winding down, and I got a call from a local realtor who wanted to buy one of the lots, and he offered me, looked me up in the appraisal district, and he offered me 200 grand. And I was in this thing for 20. Come on. And I thought it was bullshit because yeah. I'm in 200 for all the whole, all the lots. Yeah. And he says, your whole investment. But what had happened is the market had moved quickly and I didn't know because there was no on market transactions. Right. Yep. So I thought, yeah, take it. 200 for dirt and dignity. It was an 8,000 square foot lot. This was 2015. Okay. okay. So I rezoned it during that time. So I did do that. I zoned it to a good zoning. That's hard to get now. IDZ. Okay. So that did happen, but still that, that property without the zoning would have been worth 150, maybe the zoning helped, but point is market had moved. And I didn't realize it. Yep. And then that summer I got laid off. Okay. And I thought the sign, I think I'm a real estate guy now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> What's your first month uh, of real estate stuff look like where you, do you feel out of place? I remember when I quit my W2, I was like, man, I feel sort of like I'm floating out there in space or were, were you oh, just yeah. nose the grindstone, get right into it. I took two weeks off. I'd worked yeah. at that point four or five years straight yep. over the weekend, saving. I had a little bit of money in my pocket. I thought, let me relax. And at the end of about two weeks, I was like, all right, let's do this. Let's do it. Yeah. yeah. So back to more of the same, more land stuff. Well, at that time I was doing a little house flipping. So yep. like right about that time, I'd, I'd gotten involved in my first flip house, you know, it was South town at the time that bought the house for 90 grand. It's probably 400 now, Ser but seriously, yeah. put 20 grand into it and I made 20 or 30 and I sold it, that kind of deal. Yeah. I was doing a few of those and I wanted to step it up. I did a 200, 150,000, 200,000, a $300,000 house. And I was making incrementally greater margins. Okay. So I thought, all right, let me go do a house in Alma Heights for 500 grand. Yep. I got sunk, man. I lost 50 grand. Yep. Construction costs more. Resale price was less. Uh, everything. Went City home. tough to deal with. You know, I paid good contractors. That wasn't terrible, but it was just. Yeah. I just did everything wrong, man. I had to come to the table with 50 grand. And I sucks. borrowed money from people and it fucking was terrible. That sucks. Yeah. Yeah. But at that point, then I said, let me go back and buy some more of these lots. Let me buy some crummy houses. And at that point, I started to really spend the time finding title problems because I couldn't go back to the east side and buy lots cheap anymore. Yeah, that was gone. It was over with. Every cat's out of the bag. Yep. But there were a lot of properties that hadn't transacted. And I'd done a curative project early on. Okay. There was a title problem and I did fix it. And I thought, let me see if I can go fix more. But at that point, I wasn't offering people 100 grand. I'd offer them five or 10 again. It's like, you can't sell this. You got issues and people would take it. So yeah. when I started to fix those, I thought, okay, I can still buy for remarkably less than it's worth and do something that I know how to do. And it's getting, it's hard to flip a house. It's hard to buy stuff cheap. People know what's going on now. Yeah. So that was kind of how the distressed property thing really started. So you, you got in and found something with title issues that nobody else is able to figure out. Was there a, was there an attorney on your team or do you just kind of figure all this stuff out? Cause you're pretty deep into that stuff yeah. and that's become a real niche for you. And it's a pretty specialized skill set from what I gather. That's right. Yeah. How did, how did you, how'd you learn it? So I asked a title company with the first file, I had a problem. I couldn't fix it. And they said, you can't close. So they sent me over to a law firm down the street that was their referral. Yep. And I sat down asking them questions and went back and forth for a while. And finally I said, this is a lot bigger project. And I said, how much is it going to cost? He said, I don't know. I was like, gosh. So I just started making appointments with him and come and ask him questions. He's charging me his hourly rate. Yeah. We ended up fixing it. Yeah. How cool. about this? What about this? I don't know. He's calling a friend. He's calling another attorney. We're looking something up. After that process, I thought, okay, there are solves for these things. Ultimately, in the judicial system, there is a solve somewhere for every problem. Sure. The question is, is the juice worth the squeeze? Yep. So over the next couple of years, I spent time reading the property code, the estates code, the tax code, and the probate code. Yep. That's where that came. Today, I've got five attorneys. One's in office and the other four are out. And at this point, it's like, it's a, it's very systematized. And so that's really become a cornerstone of what you do is, hey, we're going to take this set of assets that is so far down the road on title issues. It's troubled. That people are going to, just about everybody's going to walk away from it. Right. Judgments, liens, IRS. Uh, child support, multiple owners, breaks in the title, changes, anything that you've seen that's caused a problem that can stop a transaction from happening, that stuff. You're looking for it. And do you have ways to go identify those that, you know, with, yeah. with data and searching for all that stuff? So now we've got, we're scraping county records, ownership yep. records. It's aggregating those and then crossing to the greatest probability of problem. Yep. And that will go into Salesforce, which is our CRM. Yep. And then when the guys get in the morning, 
and all the new uh, tagged deals pop up, that's what they start calling. That's what they start calling. Yeah. yeah. What, There's manual stuff you can look in the land records, but here's the easy answer. If folks aren't in this and just want to find trouble, go buy a delinquent tax list. Half of them have title problems. Right. Yeah. Where there's smoke, there's fire. I mean, <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's, it's just a good, yeah, it's a good indicator. Um, yeah. yeah, that's, that's, that's interesting. I love it, man. I, I done a lot of house flips, got a little down the road on that stuff, but just went a different direction. So never really, you know, it's just different it's tough, man. That's it is. the hardest. It's so a, I did a couple yeah. didn't love them. You did a couple and we're like, yeah. let me go do some operating assets. Yeah. Multifamily and commercial is like a business. And right. you were smart, I believe, because you could figure out how to operate them. And that's, I think, where you're probably your advantage. And right. then being able to finance them and raise money matters. Sure. But sure. I thought, I went, let me go this direction because it's just something I figured out at the time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's like, look, if you have success in, in any entrepreneurial endeavor, you just double down on it, right? Yeah. Keep, keep chasing it. And so, so what is it? You mentioned you have an attorney which is awesome having an attorney on staff. Um, what's the rest of the team look like for your operation today in mid 2024? So there's our head count usually is about 15 people. Sometimes we'll get up to 20 with salespeople, but salespeople are evolving door. We have a core group of them. Yep. And then there's three to four that just come and go because they're testing and every once in a while they'll add to the base. And are these just licensed brokers or they're just people that you train? I, I mean, they're, so my operation was built with a couple guys that I trained to do what I did. Yep. And then I let them do it and help capitalize them, set up an LLC, and then hire a person or two with them. Yep. And they'll run that company looking for those deals. So I've got cool. several guys that work with me now that are partners that do that. Love it. So the hires happen under them. And those folks, generally, they're not licensed brokers. It's just, I don't know. We've got one guy that came from the car business. One guy that came from the jewelry business. They were all in sales of some sales, sort. We yep. thought, you might make more money here. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Show a sales guy the, the money. Yeah. Yeah. So the good, those guys make anywhere from a hundred to 200 grand a year, roughly. Awesome. And they're basically calling our leads, cutting our deals and they put it in the funnel and it goes into either legal or a partner goes deals with it. And that's kind of the roadmap. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, so you guys are still, so what does the asset class mix look like for you now? Are you saying we like these asset class? Or are you saying hey, we like this level of distress? I don't care what it is. Yeah, if in that particular business line, which is four of the six business lines that are in that operation, you can't shop by asset class. You got to shop by the distress and yep. whatever it spits out. Like we were talking earlier, we got a 52 unit apartment complex, a single family house, a 70 acre ranch. I love it. <laughs> it's just the most random mix of problems. Yeah. Yeah. And they've all got some issues. Um, statewide, you focus in them? Yeah. I usually yeah. don't go out of the state. I'll tell you this point nine out of 10 deals are outside of Bear County. Is that right? We don't even see 95% of them anymore. When you're buying 10 acres with a dilapidated house in Freestone County for $20,000, you're covered in the land. Whether the house stays or blows away, doesn't matter. Yeah. We send a surveyor out. Yep. We'll send a realtor out, take pictures and walk it. Yep. That's it. So you guys will go cure all the title issues, liens, judgments, uh, multiple heirs, multiple owners, whatever it is, pretty it up, and then just... Throw it out. And either that realtor will list it or my wife will, depending on which MLS it's in. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So just fix the title problems. And you're mm -hmm. not touching the improvements or anything like that, really. Yeah. I don't really want to do improvements on yeah. any of that. Yeah. I love it, man. I love it. Well, there's a whole lot more dirt. We got in the land game in 2020 and, you know, you think uh, there's all these people in San Antonio or Dallas. It's true. But how much dirt is there in between in Texas? I mean, it's all wrong. a lot. Dirt. It's the values wrong. keep going up. Yeah. It's crazy, but there's a ton. Yeah. And, and there's always a transaction. Someone was asking me, when are you going to run out of these deals or the land? When are you going to run out of the opportunities? We're making money transactionally. So as transactions continue, yep. I don't care if the land is worth 5,000 or 20,000 an acre. If we can find an opportunity and move it, well, we're going to make money. So we just keep doing that. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You're not playing a, a value spread on the, the land values can be whatever they are. As long as you're finding it distressed and yeah. you're getting it at 50 cents or, or less, then you can't really mess it up, whether it's 5K an acre or 100 grand an acre, right? That's it. Yeah. 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 I love it. Yeah. What's, the, what's the most difficult thing about your business right now? Right now, I'm really happy the way it operates. Actually, I'm really thankful. Last year, with a lot of headwinds. Yep. You know, I've said this to you before. You know, we worked twice as hard for half the money. That's right. Yep. And our business was growing really well. And I got to the point where I'm like, this is, I'm happy. I can come to the office or not come to the office. I can come here and check on things and things don't, 
they don't really require a lot of me to continue. Beautiful thing. And there's growth. So I'm like, yeah. I built what I've set out to build. Yep. And the last year smashed all that. And I really had to come in and spend a lot of time just stitching the seams together and holding God, it all there. I relate to that. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's like, oh, put me in coach. <laughs> yeah. And you know, that's what you get as a business owner. That's not what you expect, but you're there and you're going to do it. Well, January or February happened. And I'm like, who blew, who blew the candle out? Like the, it's done. It's calm. It's cool again. Yeah. And I thought, okay, I got my time back. Yeah. So I'm really happy the way things are going, but you no, know, three or four months ago, so that happened for a month or two. I'm like, all right, this is great. And then I started getting restless, irritable, discontent. So, yep. well, I didn't build this to do nothing. I want to do some more things. So then I started looking at a little bit different style of project, um, maybe a little bit bigger. And I've been intimidated by those because they take a lot of my capital, large amounts at once, and a lot of other people's capital. Sure. And that thing we talked about earlier, that management plan that I don't love. Yeah, right. It requires that. Yeah, that's right. But I dislike the management plan less than I dislike not doing something new and fun and exciting, being challenged. So I, yeah. I got to deal with the management plan. That's it. Necessary. Necessary. What was the catalyst for things? Um, you said things kind of kind of come to part of the seams for us. It was growing my property management company and some personnel shuffle we did last year and then rates going, you know, 11 rate hikes. So you know, that's been keeping us busy. What was it in your business? Was it, the, was it rates? Was it rates? It was At the rates. end of the day, it was rates and it affects yeah. everybody differently. But the first thing is we were wholesaling a lot of commercial real estate. So a lot of warehousing, some multifamily, yeah. some office. It was an interesting mix. Yeah. We didn't have a preference, but if we could get it for less than, if we get a 2% spread on the income model, we're making money. Yep. So our fees would be 100, 200, 500. I mean, we had big fees on these sure. deals. The moment those interest rates shot up, game changer. And at that point, that business line had 15 people in it alone. Yep. And our overhead was about 80,000 a month in that specific business line from base pay to rent. We were paying ourselves, but we had salary employees within a couple of months of flipping negative going from, we were averaging three, 400,000 a month net on that. And all of a sudden it flipped negative 80,000 one month. I'm like, what in the heck? So we worked through this and said, is this sustainable? Can we fix it? We yep. pulled enough deals back together to not lose money a couple months. But I said, I don't see us getting profitable again. So we had to pull that whole business line. We basically let everybody go except one admin and three really good salespeople. Yep. And said, go back to distressed property. Yep. Back to your roots. In the past, we'd sell it for 90 to 95 cents on the dollar. Today, we're selling it for 75, 85 cents on the dollar. Yeah. The market's not as hot as strong as it was. Sure. But that's okay. As long as we get it for 30 or 40 cents on the dollar, we still make our money. Yep. So we had to basically deal with that three or four months of trying to make it work. And it wasn't. And when you have lower income, you have differences start to pop up. Yep. Opinions from different employees, managers, partners. I mean, we had arguments with other partners about it's going to work. It's going to not. I'm sick of you blowing more cash. I'm going to try it. I'm going to make it work. It's not about your ego, dude. Just fucking stop. Things yeah. like that. Yeah. I don't know if I can say that word. But uh, that's fine. Yeah. So we dealt with a lot of that. And when inventory would move slower, I would have to push guys to lower pricing on the distressed stuff. Sure. So finally it got in everybody's head. We got the changes made. <sighs> yeah. 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 That's it, man. <laughs> Similar song to yours, just a little different flavor, I think. That's it, man. That's it. It's been it's been quite a couple of years for for everybody that's entrepreneur figuring stuff out. It's really been a nonstop whiplash ride since COVID. So it's like we're four years into just yeah. You know, just chaos of all sorts. God, I remember when we were sitting in our office, we watched the stocks plummet. They were just plummeting for a couple of days. Yeah. And I remember we're not in the, we're not in stock trading at all. It's sure. not something I fool with. And me and my partner were like going and driving to the, the uh, Edward Jones office, wiring money to our accounts, like just dumping money in that. And this is not what we do, but. But look at it's. I ain't that damn bright, but I can spot zero. that. Yeah. So we bought a bunch of blue chip stuff immediately that day, and then like we were, it was like just euphoria in the office. We were all freaking out. It was exciting, <laughs> and when that cooled off, the real estate market was getting weird. COVID is happening. I remember thinking, should we have bought this stuff? What did we do? Yeah. That worked. It was a well tailwind like yep. the entire time. Yeah, that V <laughs> was pretty uh, pretty dramatic once. It so we sold a little early. Yeah. I think return once we doubled our money, 150% or so. My brother in law works on Wall Street and he's like, This is going to be a rebounding after the Spanish flu and people are tired of being cooped up. They're going to spend. Yeah. And they bet $100 million on it. 
I bet a couple hundred grand when it was all said and done. Yeah, right. But I sold early. I got my money out. Yep. 150%. I'm happy. Can't go wrong. Dude, they profit. rode that wave. Like, oh, man, all that PPP money. And yeah, I mean, I think we're still riding that wave halfway <laughs> through 2024, right? We talk about in the office, like, why aren't things worse than they should be, right? With with rates so high so fast. It's like that wave of money is just still kind of rolling. I don't know how much longer it has to roll, but it was so much money that just, I don't know, man. It worked itself through the system. It's insane. Really insane. smart guys understand it and they can make money on it. And they have relationships that they get to see much further up the chain than we do. Yeah. It's hard. I don't spend my time there. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. If that's not your thing, yeah. you know, it's not the time to jump in when you're, uh, when everybody's fired up or scared <laughs> or whatever. So, um, are you guys holding anything, uh, you know, operationally longer term we talk about kind of the management component is this more like business operation management or are you talking about hey let's keep some of this stuff yeah, these are assets. That we like long term so during that process there's a lot of other like things happening we started to build a rental portfolio on the east side yeah i didn't like it but also we we're buying these houses for 20 30 grand and then we looked and they're worth 100 130 so so let's Originally on our investment, it's a good return, but the return on the equity that's sitting there was poor. Yep. So I sold all those. Yep. And when I stumbled across a little metal building on Highway 16 in Bandera, yep. it was a really good project for me. And I started to understand what demand was like and how many of them there were Single there. space of 5,000 square feet or what was it? This is a 3,500 square foot building on one acre. I bought it off yep. the tax sale for 10,000 of the seller, 10,000 of the taxes. And it just looked like a shop, like a little shop. I hauled off all the trash, painted the building, cleaned it up, and sold this thing for $430,000. Yeah, come on. And I'm like, and we had, this thing sold in 30 days. There were tons of offers. People wanting to lease it. And yeah. I remember thinking, I've never had this happen with a rent house. Sure. So I start calling brokers, like, what in the world is with this? I start to learn about the demand that exists for these type of buildings. Right. So that's when I thought, let me start looking at these. So that's what I buy now. Anything less than... 50,000 square foot I know and feel comfortable with around here. Yep. And how many tenants would be in a 50,000 square foot building? How many spaces? One to three. Yeah. That, those are the, since those are like that, they're for a big tenant. Yep. A lot of the times what I find on like these 30 and 40,000 square foot, I end up with more tenants like that. But, it, yep. but see, like you're building these speculatively, so you're planning it like that. Right. But what I'm finding with these is like – one of them was a, a cabinet manufacturer. The guy built this thing. It was 25,000 foot on a three and a half acres yep. with a well back there and a septic. Nice. This was for his business. It was one large business. And when he got done and sold it to me, I realized it was just a big single tenant deal. And there's actually, there are buildings built like that, but people didn't build them speculatively. Right. So finding a lot of 30,000 square foot buildings out there is hard. It's hard. So, yeah. So that means there's a lot of demand available. Yeah. They're kind of one-off owner. Yep. Owner built, they operated out of it for 15 years. So that is a typical avatar. That business seller, yep. when he's exiting, winding down his business, that's who I buy from a lot of times. Sure, sure. Are you going in and subdividing, adding adding walls and creating more spaces, or it's just, hey, we're going to clean it up? And You know, I've been lucky enough to kind of leave them as they are. Nice. I mean, I'll clean it or do some painting and landscaping and stuff. A lot of times I have to do new lighting because the lighting generations have changed. Right. Sometimes there's electrical upgrade, but... I've got one in Mesquite up in Dallas where I'm doing right now. It's got four tenants. It's uh 29,000 square foot. And the brokers up there are just telling me these tenant bays are great size. One of them's a large one. It's 10,000, 10,000, and a couple of small ones. Yep. Uh, yeah. Five and 7,000, then like 10 and 15,000, something like that. They said, these are all great. These are lease. So I'm not going to pay to move the walls. Yeah. Right. No, they're, they're in place. And what are you seeing on, on our small bay multi-tenant warehouse stuff? We're kind of treating it like multifamily, you know, we're, we're not doing triple nets. We're not, do, we're doing shorter term leases to your leases just because explaining it to the contractor that's renting it, he likes the space and I'm not going to try to back of the napkin or have our leasing agent back of the napkin, uh, triple net. So we're just, we're well, just doing on the small bays. You see that cause it's a less sophisticated tenant yes. and that tenant many times is going to outgrow. And if you've got another spot for them to go into in a larger bay in a different location, yep. they'll do that. They'll, they'll kind of grow it. up through that. Yep. But on the little bit bigger ones, I'm finding that I can get three and five years out of them. And Love. I'm telling them all to triple net because yep. I just want less of the management issue for sure. Yeah. You're on the hook for roofs and ACs if there is one. Yep. But when you got like, 
a 10,000, 15,000 square foot, that's a bigger business, a little more stable, and they yep. can deal with that. They, and I can hand them a tax statement and they can get their ins insurance quote and we know what it is. Yeah, they understand that. Yeah, that yeah but sense. the small bays, they all have to be gross. And I noticed the old landlords that are selling to me, all their leases are gross. Yeah. So sometimes I'm just able to convert a tenant to net. And if they can afford it, yep. not much changes. Yeah. Yeah, keep it simple for everybody. Keep yeah. It simple. And so the stuff, a lot of the stuff you're finding out, you're just putting in the portfolio and growing the portfolio. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. One of, some of this stuff, what I'm running into is as the capital grows, you add some people to it. You know, the investors come in as a limited partner and I'm yep. the general. Yep. And, you know, in those, sometimes I think you're going to have like a five year trajectory, three to five years, something like that. Yep. That's what the plan is. But, you know, the other half of these, anytime I can afford it, when I find the right one and it's a good product, I'm saying, let me just buy that one. Me and my business partner will keep it, peel it off. Yep. So there's a portfolio can kind of have like almost two pieces to it. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, that's, I mean, you're dealing with all kind of, what's the range of a square footage of a, of an industrial project. You're looking from 3,500, like you said, up to 50,000 is kind of the space. At you're this planning. point, I don't really want much less than 5,000 square foot. Cause yep. I don't want to fool with it. Yep. If it's on a large, like I got a five, five and a half acres on I 35 in church. Nice. Only 6,000 square foot building, but it's on five and a half acres. So yeah. I'm probably gonna get 15,000 a month for that in rent. Sure. I would never get that on just the building. Sure. But because it came with the yard, I'll take that. Yeah. But I like to see 10, 15,000 square foot, at least on a site. Because otherwise, like, it's a lot of work to go through. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Mm -hmm. Once you've got a tenant in place or triple net, they got five years, four years of clock left. Yep. What does the management look like for the team in, you know, a month or a quarter? My gal at the front desk is making sure that the rent deposit hits the bank. Yeah. And she updates every three to six months to make sure that insurance certificate is still good and the taxes are getting paid at the end of the year. It's very light. <laughs> I love it. Me and my partner will drive like you know, every six months. We'll drive around and say, look, it's still there. Yeah. Yeah. It hadn't burned down. <laughs> yeah. That's why I like those type of assets. Oh, for sure. Yeah. You can scale that on the management side yeah. uh, a lot better. We're looking forward now, where to it. Where I find we're the most active though is in the beginning. So you guys are building. So you've got your construction crew all the way there. Yeah. Once I get it though, our real project is involving brokers right then to figure out what tenants go in there, how much they're going to cost, how long is it going to take. Yep. And then deal with a cleanup. I'm usually painting the building, sometimes replacing metal. Sure. Sometimes I'll clean up the office in there. You know, sometimes I got to deal with the parking lot, like two to three hundred thousand dollars worth of like capex. Yeah. That's kind of the that's the intensive part for me. For sure. But compared to flipping a house. Oh where you're dealing with a bunch of trades or you're trying to GC the thing yourself and you're trying to eke out 15, 20 K of margin after six or nine months. I mean, it's right. some CapEx on a metal buildings probably Simple. feels like a vacation. Right? Oh, I can deploy I can spend 300,000 on a metal building <laughs> yeah. in six weeks. And it's only three trades, maybe a parking lot guy, a painting guy, maybe some electrical and a clean out guy. Yeah. And they're all commercial guys. Dude, they have their right. shit together. They got insurance to show up on time. <laughs> Imagine that. Imagine that. That's probably one of my favorite things about doing this commercial construction. It's like, oh man, we're getting a, you know, a draw, you know, form and everything signed off by the architect. Like, oh, this, this yeah. is, this is real. Like, I mean, you're paying for it, but you're getting really good pros. Right. Right. You are versus, uh, I mean, I've seen it all flipping houses, man. Got, you just the the. The caliber you of you didn't tell trade. me to do that. Yes, I did. They got <laughs> yeah. a $3,000 dispute. <laughs> yep. Yeah. But it's, you know, it's a way to get in and it's a way to certainly learn a bunch, you know, the, yeah. good, the good and bad experiences. So, but definitely big in a lot of ways, bigger is better. Um, so what do you guys kind of see ahead for, you know, the next year you're talking with your business partner, you got the team. Is it, you think you'd be able to execute kind of more of the same for the next year or so, or you guys just keeping eyes open for, for new types of opportunities? Well, the distress stuff continues. It goes well. Each of those guys are adding a salesperson or two. You know, yep. That's not a major change. Those do their thing. Yep. The land development stuff and the industrial buildings, I think are probably where most of our growth happens. Um, I've been training a guy for a while that's going and looking for the industrial building. So he's doing the cold calling. He's in my office. I nice. pay him. Yep. So I think that starts to increase our looks and our lead flow pretty good. You know, the way our, we're set up now, if we dealt with probably two, three of those, maybe four of those a year, we could do that without being stressed. We could do that. We could get, you know, good value there. Yep. Um, and it's a pretty easy thing for people to get accustomed to, you know, next year we might look at it and say, add another person, increase speed or something. I don't know. Sure. But 
we've started to do some land development, the small lot entitlement stuff. Yeah. And the dollar values for those are really big. I've heard that and I've talked to some folks about it. What is the kind of end result? You're selling it to a, a big home developer at, with a hundred site, a hundred home sites. Is it that size or you said small? No, no. A small, a small site would be 250. So the big wow. site for me would be 450. So you'd yeah. be anywhere from on the, I can get 250 lots out of a hundred acres. I got some crummy topography there, so you could get more, but it doesn't fit there. Yep. Um, and then upwards of 400 on another site in Dallas, it's a little bit bigger, twice the size of that. And these are like, uh, how long is this entitlement process? One to three years, depending on your location. Yeah. So, so the home builders don't want anything to do with that. That's not their thing. They want to come. Well, they tried for a while and right. they actually are not bad at it, but wall street has said, we want a specific internal rate of return hurdle and we want certain financials from y'all yep. and y'all are home builders. Y'all aren't land developers. So interesting. They only do the developments that really hit a certain, they're staring at an IRR hurdle. Yep. And if they're a point away, they don't touch it. Wow. Yeah, sure. That's just, yeah, it's hard for me to believe that, but large corporations have their model. They got it, yeah, it sure. They got to put that. leaves that. a huge vacancy for guys in their land development department to get good and leave and go do this. Yep. And guys like me to find guys like them and build a business. Yeah. Cool. Cool. So one to three years, what's happening in that process? You... So the first thing is you find the land. You got to get yourself a contract with enough time to figure out what to do. But the most important part is you got to get to down there to the municipality or yep. your county, whoever's the jurisdiction, and you figure out what it is they want. Because if I want to do single family and they have no interest in single family in the area, then you can just forget about it and go home. Yep. But in our process, a lot of times we're looking for rooftops. You're already there, land that's already owned by developers. I don't want to be the first mover and I don't want to be speculative. I want sure. to be really, really sure that it's going to work. Yep. Yep. So you're looking. For so you got to get in there and figure out, does the city want it? Once yep. they do, you're going to have to. So this is something that I'm not capable of doing, but I did bring in a guy that's a vice president of one of the large public builders. Sure. Vice president of land development. Yep. He came in and partnered with me so I can find the land. I can put the capital together. Yep. And he's the one that says this project is going to work and this is why. Yeah. And I make him put money in with me. Love it. <laughs> because I'm not about to trust anybody unless they got skin. I love it. Yeah. But he's been saving. He's great at his job. He knows everyone in the city government in these areas. Yep. So he can have a quick conversation. He knows council members. That's a really important part of this. Yeah, sure. So you got to deal with utilities. You got to figure out if they're there or if you can get them there. If the municipality will help you pay to get them there. Can you get a mud or a PID to help you with your utilities to pay for them? Sure. And then you've got to understand... What, the way you figure out your land value, what you can pay is you start all the way at the end price. What's this house going to co yep. cost? Subtract construction costs. Construct, subtract construction costs of the lot. You can work your way all the way back to the land. Yep. What can I pay? What's the max they'll pay? Yep. And the difference in there, surprisingly, is usually pretty big. Those yep. entitlements can get you 1% to 300% on your purchase price. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Just doing all the legwork. Um, so I was smart enough to put the people together yeah. and find some money. Yep. And the really smart dude who like knows the business is where the entitlements are coming from. Sure. It, let's say it's a two year process. How long are you in contract with really no money at risk? And when are you actually bringing in capital, you know, ballpark in that process? I got two wildly different answers for you. Yeah. One of them I bought had almost been completely entitled by a public builder. Oh, wow. And when interest rates shot up, they cut commitments yep. because they just had to. Had to. So when I purchased it, it had a bunch of the diligence already with it. They were months shy of a development agreement with the municipality. Wow. The kicker is they had it in contract for two and a half years and released a quarter million in earnest money to the seller. He told me he'd sell it to me for the same price, which was a three-year-old, two or three-year-old price. Okay. About to close in 90 days. Yeah. It's tight on something like that. Six and a half million bucks. I had to get working. Yeah. But I felt really good about it. Because it was so far along. So far along. And I, during that process, I realized that I was buying the thing for about 25% worth, 25% less than it was worth. Ignore the entitlements, ignore everything. I'm getting a land at 25% discount. Yep. When I realized that, I rocket shipped to go put money together. Yeah. About six calls, money was there. I had the money together in a week. Love it. And then I closed right around the 60, no, 90 day mark, I think on that one. Yeah. Now that one, that's an extreme example. The other one, I'm actually not taking title this thing. It's going to be a double close. I'll have a year long contract Outstanding. seven or eight months into it. Sure. I spent 250 grand in entitlement fees and just stuff, legal fees, whatever yep. engineering. Yep. But we should close by the end of this year. 
and the seller knows what I'm doing. Yeah. We're very upfront. Yeah. You're putting your own money up to get it there. And he gets a premium on the sales price. Sure. But he also knows I'm going to flip it to a builder, make money. So on yeah. that one, I'll be in it for 6 million. Well, purchase price plus my couple hundred grand is a total of 6 million. Yep. Uh, exit should be right at 10. We're negotiating a contract right now at nine and a half. We hope to get him to 10. Yeah. It's a great spread. We'll walk with about four. Yep. And I'll split it up among four guys. My developer partner, my business partner, the guy that brought the deal to me. Yep. Are you guys at a point where you're looking at like, Hey man, come tax time, we need to find some depreciation on some of these assets. Are you, are you getting that on some of the, the buildings have helped. They've yeah. really helped. Yeah. yeah. That's one of the things I've, <laughs> that's made a big difference. Yeah. The multifamily's always helped me. It's like, man, Oh, you got pretty, huge amounts of pretty months. big, but it's like a lot of the other stuff doesn't have any of it. So you just yeah. kind of looking at the year going like, Oh, we can't really sell too much this year. Well, so I'm, I'm a, my business partner was a tax partner in a national firm. Love it. And I was really scared about taxes. I didn't understand them well. He's taught me a lot. But one thing he always leads with, is it a good deal? Should you sell it now? Then do it. Right. Figure out what to do the taxes. But he said, I've seen too many people make poor business decisions because they're worried about the taxes. Yep. So I never looked at it. I've always said, if it's time to sell, it's time to sell. And sometimes we've been able to have some pretty good exchange um, trails where we exchange nice. from one to the other yep. and defer that a while. We make decisions sometimes. Do we buy this in December or January, depending on when we're trying to line them up Sure, or the depreciation, but, but you're not letting the tail wag the dog. You're saying it's always deal focus, return yeah. focus. And worst case scenario, I'm going to pay some taxes, but sure. Day, I'm way better off than I was in the beginning. So. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. hundred percent. I love it, man. So yeah. you've taken some of this, uh, you got great social presence. You're sharing a lot of, uh, a lot of this stuff with everybody online. Yeah. doing starting to do some events now talk to talk to me about that you know folks kept asking us to help and i started talking about it on the internet because i thought it was fun and cool and neat sure yeah you're into it yeah and then people start saying well can you do this with me for me and i thought "Uh oh like what do i do now right right so i did put together a coaching program we'll do an event once a year i'm gonna do one coaching program here it's about six months long for the distressed property stuff cool we do have a mastermind coming up in san antonio 22nd 23rd that's going to be two days, a bunch of guys and gals from my office. Like this is our roadmap. We'll tell you how to do it. And we'll probably teach you how to do it on your own or be a JV partner with us, but yeah. you'll make money somehow. Yeah. And getting nothing like getting in the room and, and actually learning from people that are, that are doing it. So yeah. Small group, 50 people We yeah. break up into a couple of groups. So you can really talk. Right. Right. It's not some huge weekend seminar business that you're running. It's, right. it's just more of a chance to. I like talking to people about it. It's a chance to kind of share it. It's a chance to, you know, obviously you got to charge for an event and make some money out of it, but yeah, it's uh, and then maybe there's potential capital partners out of that for you, potential connections, all that good stuff. So that social media thing has been really special when it comes to credibility. Yeah. I had no idea what that would do from great employees in our office. I've made business partners off the internet. Sure. Off the, yeah. That's been big. Yeah. It's wild. I, I know, I know we've bought, you know, we bought $30 million deals where, it's like, well, we, we watch your podcast a little bit and we looked into you and it's like, well, good. Cause I know the other guys bidding on this <laughs> are not out there in that way. And now at least you know me a little bit better. Right. And, uh, and countless other, you know, kind of advantages, but, uh, fascinating time to be alive and doing business. It is isn't it? So, semi publicly on the internet. <laughs> semi publicly. Yeah. Right. I mean, you're out there talking about all this stuff. So yeah. that's wild. Um, well, Logan, this has been awesome, man. Thanks for coming in. Appreciate you sharing, sharing your story, sharing some time. Where do we send people if they want to kind of get in your universe? Send them to social or email or what put do you my name do? in Google. You're okay. going to wind up on my Instagram or you're yeah. going to wind up on my website and it's Logan Fulmer. All right. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming out, man. There Appreciate you go. It. This is fun. fun. All right. See ya. Thank you for listening to the DJE podcast. For more information, please go to DJETexas.com.